Well, welcome to our final session in the study of the book of Colossians. I really hope this has been a blessing for you as it has been for me. Now, I know if you're looking at the passage, we're looking at chapter 4, verses 2 through 6 in this study. And you could say, well, what about the rest of chapter 4? Well, the rest of chapter 4 is all those greetings that we talked about at the very first, uh, first two sessions. So I've kind of included that in the first two overview kind of sessions as a way where I didn't have to deal with them at the end here. So again, if you want to work through those kind of final greetings of Paul, uh, you can look back at those first two overview sessions. So what I want to do is I want to wrap up this particular study in the book of Colossians by looking at this final element of the practicality of the Christian life. Uh, and again, we've been looking at the context of the entire book, which is this idea of the preeminence of Jesus. It's the fact that Jesus is to have first place in absolutely everything in our lives. In every arena, would you make Jesus first? Now, we've been walking through the practicality of the Christian life, and we've been looking at the internal and, and the relational side of things, but let's dive into this section, which focuses on the prayer and the proclamation. So let's read Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. Paul says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been bound, that I may make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. It's an incredible passage. I really want to break it into two sections. One, talking about prayer, and then talk about this idea of proclamation. So in this first idea of prayer, uh, let me just read again verse 2. Paul says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Uh, that word for prayer is, is there's, there's several words in the New Testament used for prayer. This is probably the most generic word for prayer. It's kind of the overarching idea of prayer. It's the big umbrella idea. So the concept here is, hey, be devoted to have this constant conversation. Be devoted to have this constant intimacy and conversation with our Lord. Just be in this constant, humble, kneeling position of, of offering our requests unto the Lord. It's interesting that Paul uses the idea of devoted. That word devote yourselves is this idea of to continue or to persist or persevere it means to have a devotion for an activity, to attach oneself to, or be steadfast. So he says, hey, would you just continue, persist, persevere? Would you just attach yourself and be steadfast in prayer? He also uses the word watchful, which is this idea of to be on alert, to be awake, to beware. And he says, you should be praying with thanksgiving, which is obviously this idea of, of gratitude. Does that define your life? For Christians, for whatever reason, we often love talking about prayer more than we love to pray. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, but there's been the moments in my life where I said, okay, I, I really need to become more of a man of prayer. I, I really want to seek the Lord with a heart of prayer. So I know, I know what I need to do. Uh, uh, oh, I'll, I'll go get a book by like Ian Bounds on prayer and read more about prayer so I understand prayer so that I can do it. And for whatever reason, I get to the book and I'm reading through the book. I'm like, yeah, this is great stuff. And by the time I get through the book, I am actually not even praying. I, nothing's actually changed in my prayer life. I just have more knowledge and more understanding about the depth of prayer. I don't know about you, but I, you know, you come to church and a lot of times someone will say, oh, I'll pray for you, dear brother. Oh, I'll pray for that need, dear sister. And, and we make these statements of, hey, I'll, I'll pray for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll pray for you. How often do we actually do that? How often when we tell someone that we're going to pray for them, do we actually pray for them? Uh, one of the things that God's been checking in my spirit over the last several years is those times where I say, hey, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be praying for you. And I will say, okay, before I even go on, I need to pray. And if they're right there, a lot of times I'll just say, hey, can I, can I just pray with you right now? Or as soon as I get out of the conversation, I will go and I'll spend some time in prayer because I don't want to just give lip service to prayer. Oh, I'll be praying. Oh, yeah, I love prayer, but not actually do the activity of prayer. Do you know the best way to learn how to pray? Do you know one of the best ways to actually learn how to have a life of prayer? Pray. <laughs> it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Rather than reading more books on prayer, rather than going through studies on prayer, 
why don't we actually just begin to spend time with God in prayer? And it's in the activity of prayer that he will not only teach us to pray, but he will give us a heart to pray. Now, I'm not against resources. I love Ian Bounds on prayer. I love Leonard Ravenhill's stuff on prayer. But let's not substitute the books and the resources and the online courses on prayer for actually doing the work of praying. Let us be men and women who, as Paul says, are devoted, who are, have this passionate, steadfast, relentless hold on prayer. Let us be watchful in prayer. Just, just, as, just as a watchman on, on a city gate would be, would be staring out and making sure that he doesn't fall asleep and making sure that there's no enemy coming and, and, and making sure that the, the town is safe, let us have that same attitude in this generation as people who pray. Uh, I do, on this topic of prayer, I do love the old saints, uh, especially like the Leonard Raven Hills and the Ian Bounds, their stuff on prayer. And I'm not just saying go read them. I'd rather have you just pray than go read their books. But let me give you a few of the pithy statements, that some of my favorite statements and, and quotes on this idea of prayer, specifically from some of these great men of prayer. These guys didn't just merely talk about prayer. They spent and labored themselves in prayer. As I look at Christian history, if I said, okay, who were those who were actually devoted and watchful in prayer? These would be some of the guys on my short list. You know, people like Jonathan Edwards and, and David Brainerd and, and some of those guys that I'm not going to mention. Those are some phenomenal men of prayer. But here's some great quotes from some of my favorites. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill said this, No man is greater than his prayer life. And before I even read the rest of the quote, do you hear that? No one is greater than his prayer life. But Ravenhill goes on and says, The pastor who is not praying is playing the people who are not praying are strain. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. We have a lot of pastors, but few wrestlers. We have many fears, but few tears. We have much fashion, but little passion. We have many, many interfe interferers, but few, inter but few intercession. Many riders, but few flighter, fighters. And failing here in prayer, we fail everywhere. Ian Bounds, I love this quote. He says, these days of ours has a sore, which this idea of desperate need of a generation of praying men, a band of men and women through whom God can bring his great and his greatest movements more fully into the world. The Lord is not limited within himself, but he is limited in us by reason of our little faith and weak praying. A breed of Christian is greatly needed who will seek tirelessly after God, who will give him no rest day and night until he hearkens to their cry. The times demand pray men who are all athirst for God's glory, who are broad and unselfish in their desires, quenchless for God, who seek him late and early, and who give themselves no rest until the whole earth be filled with his glory. What a great statement. Andrew Murray says, the sin of prayerlessness is a proof that the life of God in the soul is in deadly sickness and weakness. Samuel Chadwick said, It would seem as if the biggest thing in God's universe is a man who prays. There's only one thing more amazing, and that is that man, knowing this, should not pray. In other words, what Samuel Chadwick is saying is the greatest thing in all the, in all the universe is someone who prays. And yet what is more crazy and more astounding than the fact that the greatest thing is a person who prays is knowing that the greatest thing is a person who prays and yet they don't pray. It's a sad commentary for the days in which we live. There's a writer who wrote under the uh, name Unknown Christian and he said, if there are any regrets in heaven, the greatest will be that we spent so little time in real intercession. And Ravenhill again says, I believe most of us will need the tears white from our eyes when the books are open at the judgment bar of God and our personal prayer record is read. Are you a person of prayer? Now, when you look at back at some of the great ministries of like Charles Spurgeon or William Booth, the thing that they would say that characterized the, the effectiveness and the, and the powerful movement of God in their ministry is the fact that they were men of prayer, but they also had a band of people who were praying underneath the stage. These people who were unknown, people who didn't care about the fame and the prestige, but who were just desirous for a movement of God in their generation. 
could I encourage us? Could I encourage us in this generation to be men and women who don't just talk about prayer, but who actually labor in prayer, who find ourselves devoted unto prayer, who are watchful in prayer with thanksgiving, as Paul says. Let us not merely give the lip service of prayer. Let us labor in it. So Paul in our passage says, hey, be devoted unto prayer, be watchful with thanksgiving. But then he turns and he talks about this idea of proclamation. So in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6, this is what he says. He says, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been bound, that I may make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. Paul says, hey, would you be a person who is willing to proclaim this wondrous mystery? Hey, pray for us that, that the word of God, the doors of the word to be opened so that we could proclaim it. But would you be a person who would also proclaim this grand mystery of Jesus Christ? I love how scripture, as you, as you do a study on this idea of the, the mouth or the tongue, that our speech really is significant in scripture. That we should not take our speech lightly. That it matters what comes out of our lips. And as Paul is walking through this passage, he says that you are to walk in wisdom. And again, that word of wisdom is this idea of wisdom or prudence or the deep things of God. But we should walk in wisdom specifically toward outsiders. And he's, in the context, he's talking about unbelievers. Uh, l- listen to this statement by Warren Wiersbe. In clarifying this idea of walking in wisdom to the outsiders or unbelievers, Wiersbe says it means that we are careful not to say or do anything that would make it difficult to share the gospel. It also means that we must be alert to use the opportunities God gives us for personal witnessing. Do you do that? Do you walk, do you live in such a way that your life is a grand declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And again, it goes back to some of our previous studies where if God has transferred me from the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of light, if I have slayed the selfish and I put off all the things that are not of Christ and I've actually put on the Lord Jesus Christ, well, then my life should be this declaration of him. That, that there shouldn't be anything in my life that hinders the testimony and the declaration of the gospel through my life. Is that true for you? Are there things in your life that you wouldn't want an unbeliever to see because they might say, that's the life of a Christian? That's the attitude, that's the motive of a believer? Is it possible for God to do such a deep, radical alteration and change and transformation of our lives that everything that comes out of our lives is a a beautiful declaration of Jesus? I I love this old story of David Livingston. Uh, He was in Africa and all these stories were coming out of Africa about this man named David Livingston. And so this man, this, this newspaper reporter decided that he was going to go and, and find David Livingston and see if these reports were true. And so he left England and got on the ship and went over to Africa and then got on a train and went into interior and then, you know, rode the donkey and got on, you know, rode the canoe and all that kind of stuff to finally, after several weeks, make it to David Livingston. He spent some time with David Livingston, eventually made his way back. And after several months of a journey, he re- arrived back in England and everyone was really excited to hear about his stories and if, if all the stuff about David Livingston was true. And they threw him a big party and they, they wanted to get the, the inside scoop before it was released in the newspapers. And someone asked the newspaper reporter, they said, Henry, is, is everything about David Livingston true? I mean, is all the stories or is it, is it just, you know, is, is it exaggerated? And here's what the newspaper reporter said. He said, everything that we've heard is true. And then he made this statement. He said, And had I spent another moment with David Livingston, I too would have become a Christian. I would have been a believer, but yet he never spoke of it once. Now, I'm all for declaring the gospel with our mouths. But wouldn't it be interesting if our lives reflected the reality of the gospel as well? That like David Livingston, somehow this man who just spent a few days or weeks 
with David Livingston was just so overwhelmed by what was going on in the life of David Livingston that he said, if I had, I just, had I spent more time with him, I, I would have been compelled to become a Christian. I want that for our lives. This generation, as Ian Bounds said, is in desperate need of a band of men and women who are all athirst for God's glory. That we don't care about the prestige or the popularity for ourselves. That, who cares about that stuff? We want the glory of God to be seen. We want the gospel of Jesus to be declared. Does your life do that? Or does your life produce a hindrance for others to hear the gospel? Oh, that you might find yourself in a position of humility and surrender and consecration before the Lord so that he can change whatever is, whatever is going on in our lives that does not look like him. So there is no barrier between our lives and someone hearing the gospel. So again, there should be nothing in our lives that would jeopardize our testimony or the gospel to unbelievers. And then Paul makes this interesting statement in the passage. He says that we are to redeem the time, which means to buy it up, to redeem, or make the most of every opportunity. So when you get this context of what Paul's saying, he's saying, hey, be devoted to prayer. Just go crazy with intimacy and, and relationship with Jesus. Hey, just be devoted and watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. And your life is to proclaim the wonders of the word. And he says, hey, redeem the time. Buy up the time. Realize that time is short. And as such, live in such a way that you make most of every opportunity that God places in front of you to share the wondrous reality of the gospel. For so many of us, we, we get so distracted with busyness and the things of this world and, and all, this, all this stuff that we are not buying up the time. I mean, one of the best illustrations of buying up the time, uh, that, that idea is I was, at a, I was at a store once and I said, hey, I, I need one of those things. It's on sale. Uh, and I was starting to make my way over to the shelf where this, this item was. And as I was getting to the shelf, you know, it was, on, it was on sale and this woman got really excited. And so she, she, on her, she had her cart and she literally took her arm and just took everything on the shelf and just, went, and just threw it into the cart. And of course, I was like, I just need one of those. But she bought it up. She just, she redeemed it. The term in the Greek is actually, it's a commerce. It's, a, it's the language of a, of a shop uh, or of the marketplace. And the idea is to you literally just buy up everything. Paul says, would you, would you realize that time is short? Would you make the most of the time? Would you make the most of every opportunity? Would you, will you just go crazy with the reality of sharing the gospel? That, that I don't want to just throw away my time today in frivolous stuff when there's opportunities set in front of us. Paul says, redeem the time. Why? Well, the, the days are short. In fact, let me just give you a few passages on that idea. Uh, these are so just deeply stirring in my heart. James 4, 13 through 14. James says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Or Psalm 89 verse 47 says, Remember how short my time is. Job 7.7 7 says, Oh, remember that my life is a breath. <clears throat> and over and over throughout Scripture, we're reminded that, that life is short. Life is but a vapor. It is just a, it is a blink of an eye. Uh, it is winter time in Colorado as we're re as we're recording this, and it is freezing uh, right now. We have a high of 12 degrees, <laughs> which is which is cold, uh, and it's 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 in the afternoon and it's it is freezing today. So you go outside, and of course you know it's kind of fun to go oh, right to see your breath. But have you ever watched your breath in cold air? It's it's this vapor for about half a second, and then just kind of disappears. The Bible says that is the length of our life. Time is short. So in the context of proclamation, Paul says, hey, would you make the most of every opportunity? Would you redeem the time for the gospel and not just be drawn away? Yeah, there's important things we need to do. But would you redeem the time for Jesus? Would you, would you leverage your life for the sake of the gospel? Realize that your life is short. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. You could just go outside and just go, oh, and just see your breath for half a moment and go, that is the length of my life in light of eternity. So let us make most of every single day 
that God gives us. Not for our selfish whims. Yeah, we got to work. And, and yeah, yeah, I understand that. We got family stuff. And I'm not downplaying any of that. But let us redeem the time for the sake of the gospel. That is eternal. That's an internal investment. Because that's what lasts forever. Well, Paul finishes up with this statement. He says, let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Uh, salt back in his day was a preserving uh, element as well as a flavor element. Wouldn't it be interesting if the way that we spoke to unbelievers was full of grace and seasoned with salt? In other words, our, desires, our desire was that the way that we would speak would not be a hindrance to the gospel, that we'd actually speak with a winsome reality that would give this heart, this passion, desire for people to actually know Jesus Christ. That we weren't just walking up to an unbeliever and being like, hey, you need a Jesus, da, 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 da. be like me, I'm happy. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not like that. The reality is we are to be winsome, that we are to be gracious, that, that our language should be having some salt in it, which is, again, flavor and a preserving element. So here's the idea. Our speech should be graceful and winsome, and our speech should make it easy for someone to actually hear the gospel, both with our lives and with our lips. Uh, Peter said this in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. In other words, make him first. Uh, put him as the very first in your hearts. Sanctify him. Make him Lord and King. And then he says, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Paul says, hey, you, you put Christ first in your life, so therefore always be ready to give it a defense of this hope that you have. That when someone looks at your life, they should go, wow, you are so full of hope. I love the days in which we live. We have crested something over the last couple of years where people are rather hopeless. We used to cover all of that with success and money and fame and thinking that the world's fine and doing great. But with all the COVID craziness that has happened, a lot of people are hopeless. People are desperate. What would it look like if you and I lived with hope? If we began to live with eternity in mind and, and when we lived with joy and peace and love, people are going to ask, how is it that you have hope? How is it that you are walking in joy and peace and love? Peter says you are always to have an argument. You're always to be ready to declare the wonders of that hope. And when you do it, do it with gentleness and reverence. Be kind, be gracious in how you speak. Season it with some salt, but always be ready to give a declaration of the hope that lies within you. But what is that hope? Jesus. Always be ready to declare Jesus in your life. Well, what am I going to say? I love what Jesus says in Matthew, 9, or Matthew chapter 10, verse 19 through 20. Jesus says, don't worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So don't be intimidated. Hey, would you get in, into the Word? Would you let the Word of God dwell in you richly? When you dwell in Jesus, when you dwell in his word, he will put words in your mouth. Wouldn't it be phenomenal if the way that you live and the way that you talk would just declare to the world that the only explanation for your life was Jesus? And as such, it's going to cause a hunger and a drive within them to say, what, what is this hope that lies within you? And you can just say, oh, it's Jesus. Can I tell you my story? Can, can I tell you what Jesus is doing in my life? Can, can I tell you the fact that you too can have hope because of Jesus. Embrace him. Make him Lord and King of your life. Man, that is so phenomenal. Can I encourage you in light of this idea of prayer and proclamation to be praying for one very specific thing? And it's to pray for boldness. We are so timid in this culture. I am so guilty of this. You know, you, you have this opportunity and and you're like, I, I really should say something. I really should make a declaration of the gospel. And it's like, uh, 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 uh. and then the situation passes, and then you go, oh, I should have said something. I find it interesting that as you read through the book of Acts, and I, I would encourage you to do this, notice how many times that they asked for boldness, or it says that with great boldness they went out and did something, or they asked for prayer for boldness. They were constantly realizing that it wasn't them. It wasn't their personalities. It wasn't their boldness that allowed them to proclaim the gospel. 
It was the reality of Christ living within them through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God became the boldness that they needed, gave them the boldness to proclaim the wonders of the gospel. For example, in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says that when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. We need that. Or in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul wraps up that letter and he says, Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Can I encourage you? Be devoted. Be watchful in prayer. Be willing to proclaim and to testify of the hope that lies within you. The fact that Jesus is enough. He is sufficient. He's all things that you need for life and for godliness. But would you pray very specifically for boldness? Would you ask God to, to, inv- to enliven you and to embolden you to be a mouthpiece, both with your life and with your lips, in this generation to declare the wonders of the gospel, to declare truth in the midst of a, a decrept and de- deceived generation. We need men and women who not just talk about prayer, but pray. We need people who don't just say, woo, yay, the gospel. We need people who actually proclaim the gospel. And God has chosen you. You are his mouthpiece to this world. If you are a Christian, you are called to prayer and you are called to proclaim. So would you ask for God's boldness? Even if you're shy, even if your personality is, is rather meek, that's, that's good. He can use that. But would you be open? Would you seek him? And would you allow the overwhelming resource and the spirit of God to come within you and produce boldness in you to declare the wonders of who he is? I want to finish with two quotes, again, on this idea of prayer. Samuel Bringle, loved the man, was a great evangelist. He said, all great soul winners, or if I can put it maybe in the context of our passage, all great proclaimers of the gospel, have been men or women of much and mighty prayer. And all great revivals have been preceded and carried out by preserving, prevailing knee work in the closet. And A.T. Pearson said this, There has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Can I encourage you to be such a man or a woman? Be someone of prayer. Be a man or a woman who proclaims. And do not be afraid. For as Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 reminds us that he will never, ever, ever leave or forsake us. So what can the world do to us? There's no reason to fear. You have Almighty God living inside of you. I know these studies have been rather short. I wish we could have had probably, you know, a hundred more studies in the book of Colossians. I love, I've, I've so come to love this book. There's such depth and richness in it. And obviously we have not had time to get through all of it in 14 sessions. Could I just remind you to join me in this study of it? Could I, could I just remind you that uh, if you're interested in diving deeper, to getting some Bible study resources, to get study guides for every single one of these sessions, as well as all the session notes and the stuff that I've been using to, to communicate to you with, you can get all of that by signing up in the link below, either below this video or in the show notes for the, for the audio. But I would so be blessed for you to join me in the study. Now, even if you've already listened to all these episodes, I would still encourage you to download the study notes. As you have time at some point in the, in the far future, near or far future maybe, <laughs> to, to begin to study this book even more in depth. Again, we just crested the very tip of the iceberg in these studies. And I would, so, I would count it a great blessing for you to join me in a greater depth of study. There's some additional Bible study resources uh, available with that as well. Uh, I, I included an audio preaching series that I've done in the book of Colossians that I, I spoke at a camp. So all of that is contained there, as well as a bonus final episode, which is going to come next for those of you who sign up. Uh, it's going to be really short, for just clarity's sake. Uh, but there's a bonus thing. Uh, but I just, I just want to help equip you to learn how to study God's Word, but specifically understand what is happening in the book of Colossians. Regardless, would you pursue Jesus? As we've been talking about the context, would you make Jesus preeminent in your life and make him first place in absolutely everything? Oh, that is my desire for you.
Well, let's pray. Lord, we do love you. Oh, Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity to engage with you in prayer, that we can have intimacy and richness of communion with you. So, Lord, may we be diligent. May, may we just pursue you in prayer. May we be devoted in our prayer lives. Lord, I pray that we'd be watchful with thanksgiving in prayer. And Lord, I pray that we would be great proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus. That we wouldn't be nervous, that you would remove all the fear, that you would be our peace, but that you would just bubble forth the reality of what you've been doing in our lives, up and out of our lives, and that the, the richness of the gospel would be proclaimed and we would declare the hope that lies within us, which is you. Lord, thank you for the study and just what you've been doing. Oh, we give you all the praise and the glory in your precious, overwhelmingly powerful name. Amen.